what I'm going to be focusing on today is actually the subtitle, the missing link. Uh, the people who are interested in sustainability, and I strongly suspect that's 100% of you guys, uh, don't look at the money system as relevant. Okay? And the people who take care of the money system are not aware what it does to sustainability. And that is the key message that I want to convey, how these two things are related, and why what's happening now actually could become a huge liberation or a big problem, depending on how we look at it and how we deal with it. So let's start with a very simple question. Who creates money? Okay, is it, uh, how many of you believe it's the government? Nobody. Interesting. There's an enormous progress. Seven years ago, the majority of the people were thinking that. How many of you believe it's the central bank? Okay. Apple? How many of you believe it's someone else? Two? Three? Okay. So basically, the majority of you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because... It, it is so many of us. Okay. Normally, normally, the money, all national monies, I would call them national in quotation marks, because they're in fact a private creation. Normally, they're created by banks, with the majority of which are private, uh, with interest as debt. So every euro you've seen, every dollar you've seen, every yen you've seen, is someone's debt, and it needs to be paid back with interest. That's the mechanism by which we create our money. By the way, it's fascinating by itself that you can take a, a doctoral degree in, in, in economics and they don't tell you. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Right? Now, how many have used something else than national money? Okay, we were three. Okay, how many have used frequent fly marks? Okay. Or point carrefour, the supermarket points. Anybody? No? All right. So those who lifted the land lately are actually been using complementary currencies without knowing it. We're using things and are not aware that they're currencies. Of course, today, we can define it broader than that, but that is the starting point, but we don't know. Now, my key message is the following. Our money system, as it currently exists in the current <coughs> paradigm, is programming systematically unsustainability. It's programming it systematically in many different ways. So what we're swimming against, when you talk about sustainability, is that invisible current that everybody is swimming in unconsciously, which is our money system. Now, the first one is, and that's probably not new, it's systemically unstable itself. We have big crashes, bigger and bigger ones. So that itself creates a very unsustainable environment, with lots of programs, lots of ideas, lots of projects that were underway, whether it's in businesses or in governments, are suddenly stopped. The second way is it actually creates more fluctuations in the economy by the way the money is created. I'm going to explain each one of those in more detail in a minute. The third one is people who believe that we should go to a steady economy or degrowth don't understand money. Because the next sentence should be, we need to change the money system. It is impossible mathematically to stop growing with the current money system. The fourth one is, concentrates wealth. Automatically, independently of what people do. And the fifth one is, we are soft, often saying that CEOs should think long term, and uh, because we need to think about our grandchildren, uh, but the reason that we're thinking short-term is not a defect in the brain. 
it is one of the programming features of our money. And finally, how many of you believe that competition is a good idea? Or have we not gone overboard with competition? Well, actually, again, we're programmed. Those these six things are automatically programmed within our current money environment. All right, the first one. It is systemically unstable. The last big one has been 2007, 2008, which frankly I thought was big enough to wake people up. Uh, obviously, it hasn't been that way yet. Now, first, the other thing that's curious is that the media, when they talk about the crisis, they always talk about the last crisis as if it's the only crisis. In fact, here are the statistics from the IMF. Between 1970 and 2010, there have been 145 countries gone through a banking crash. There have been 204 monetary collapses, i.e. the currency itself that becomes worthless, like in Argentina or in, Britain, or in uh, uh, Russia, for example, it's two big cases. There have been 76 for sovereign debt crises. In fact, we should say 77, because now we have Greece since that time period. So all these things are simply facets of a systemic flaw. There's a different places where we focus on where the problem is. It's like saying you have a flu, and I consider one disease, well, that you have a runny nose, another disease that you have fever, and a third one that you have aching joints. They're all part of the same disease, simply at different phases, and at different places where the system cracks but it's the same system. So that means that we have actually had more than 10 per year in the last 40 years, which is, you know, if you had a car with a track record, <laughs> or say, a plane, wouldn't someone think that it's a good idea to go back to the drawing board? In the monetary domain, we just pull it out of the round, put it back on the thing, dust off the wheels, and off you go, until the next crash. So, now, even when the system works well, okay, besides the phenomenon of financial crisis, which is systemic and repeated, even when it works well, you still have the other five problems. All right. But let's first understand why it is systemically unstable. What's happening to make it systemically unstable? Well, we have been able in the last seven years to uh, develop with a team in the United States uh, actually a theoretical framework that explains why that is so. It has to do with the conditions of stability of any complex flow network. Now, there are lots of different complex flow networks. Yeah. Any natural ecosystem is one. Your immune system is one. The electrical distribution system is one. All these systems have in common to be complex flow networks. Something flows in it. And what we've discovered, it may not be surprising, is that there are actually two things that need to be in a balance. One is efficiency, i.e. the capacity for that system to process volume. And the second one is resilience, that capacity for that system to survive a change of environment, a shock, a disease, an attack, whatever it is. Now, and what's surprising is, we are lucky <laughs> in that sense, there are only two network variables that are involved. It doesn't depend on what flows in it. That's the big, big group. It's actually, the two variables are diversity and interconnectivity. Uh, let's take the example of a natural ecosystem, of which there are thousands different ones in the world. So that is a high diversity environment. This is will shock resist many shocks. Okay? While the squirrel, the squirrel is photographed in Central Park in New York, it hasn't eaten something natural in about you know 50 generations. Uh, but it is very c capable of surviving in, it even needs cardboard, by the way, for example. So it can, it can survive lots of things. Let's take another example. This is low diversity. 
this is more efficient. You produce more timber per year with that kind of forest. But you better don't smoke or don't drop a cigarette or don't drop a piece of glass because it can all be gone in a couple of hours. Highly unstable but very productive. It requires permanent maintenance <laughs> to make it sure that it doesn't fall apart. And the panda is a very good animal. Uh, everybody likes it. However, it needs only one kind of bamboo. And therefore, it is risky disappearance. Now, in natural ecosystems, that's what we do. We have two times to three times more importance on resilience than on efficiency. So, these systems are focused more on that variable rather than how much can we put per unit of time, per year, or that can, how much can it produce. And that's actually the secret for its resilience. Now, in the monetary domain, in financial networks, we are having zero interest in the resilience. We don't even measure it. We don't even know how to measure it. And everything is put on efficiency. So, curiously, the current money system is overly efficient. Okay? It produces, it is capable of processing huge volumes of money. In a day, the foreign exchange trading is actually 50 times bigger than the uh, trade in the world, international trade. So in other words, we have a huge capacity for processing volume. But, but it is unstable. Now, you've probably heard what I'm saying as a metaphor, right? That I'm comparing a natural ecosystem with the money system. I'm not comparing the rules that apply to both systems are what we're talking about. The uh, conditions of stability for any complex flow network apply to any complex flow network of the same structure. So when you have a monoculture, a single type of currency, and that's what we do worldwide, even in the Soviet system, it was the same money system. The only difference was that the governments owned the shares in the banks. But they were producing money the same way we do. Uh, we do that in the Western society or in capitalist societies only when the banks fall apart. But that's when the government owns the banks. But it's the same system. Now, money in an economy plays the same role as biomass in a natural ecosystem. And the structure is what determines the, what, whether it will be stable or not. So the bottom line of that, we should get out of the idea, which is 5,000 years old, of having, uh, trying to do everything with a single currency. And then this particular kind of currency in addition. So that's why it's unstable. We need a monetary diversity to attain financial stability. stability. Good. Second point. The way money is created today amplifies whatever little bump you have in the economy. There is something called a business cycle or an inventory cycle. Businesses produce stuff. And when they have to reduce too much, they have to kind of slow down a bit, fire a bunch of people, and, and then relaunch the, when the stock is down again. Now, with the way we create money, that is by banks creating money through debt, what that does is actually whenever there's a bump up, we have, it goes up much higher because more money is pumped into the system because the economy is doing well. And when things go down, everything stops because nobody, the banks don't do money anymore because they do it only for private interest. So it's not interesting to produce it when, it is, when the economy is going down. And central banks are trying to counteract that, but with very, very limited success. The systemic problem is there. Now, the third point is compulsory growth. We have no option not to grow. When a bank creates money, it creates the principle. You buy a house, 
you borrow $100,000 or 100,000 euros, you borrow that from the bank, they create 100,000, but they ask you to bring back 200,000 in 20 years. Where's the second 100,000 coming from? From someone who borrows money next year. If they don't borrow the money next year, the money does not exist for you to pay back. So, in other words, growth is not an option. It's a necessity in that system. Without new loans, everybody goes bankrupt. As simple as that. Now, the next one. Money creates, the money system concentrates automatically wealth. We can understand, and that's the usual justification, that you know, entrepreneurs should have an incentive to do things that are successful and therefore make more money. That's not the part I'm talking about. I'm part of just talking what the money system itself does, passively, and we're all living in that same system. Does anybody have an idea what the median wealth is? The median is the most frequent number of U.S. households. Anybody have an idea? Wealth, not income. Wealth. Yeah, wealth. 45,000? 45, Any other number? Minus $30,000. Today? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> You're actually closer to the number. No. Okay. Here's the result. This is uh, statistics from the Federal Reserve. This was in 2007, before the crisis. Since the crisis that has moved left, as you're saying, you're actually to negative territory. I took purposely the, the, the number in 2007 before the crisis. So the median is actually zero. That's the most frequent number. Now, in terms of concentration of wealth, Bill Gates is three and a half miles. Three and a half kilometers on the right here. <laughs> okay? In that same year. So the distribution is way out there in that direction. Now, what has that to do with money? Again, just giving the result. Here is a study, it's the only study that I have seen done anywhere. It was done in Germany, which is a country with, during the period when I was in Deutsche Mark which had the, one of the lowest interest rates, so certainly lower than the other major countries. So only Switzerland had a lower interest rate on the average. Uh, and this is dividing the families of households in Germany in deciles, groups of 10% of the population, according to their wealth. What we're seeing is that the eight lowest groups are paying more interest than they uh, receive. Uh, and the ones that are about even is the ninth decile and everything goes to the top, 10%. So this is an automatic suction device from 80% of the population to the top 10%. Mm -hmm. Purely to interest, independently of what you do as activity. Now, you may think this has to do with interest is something where I borrow myself the money. No, it runs deeper than that. Here are the numbers for Germany. If you have the garbage collection, about 12% of that is interest. If you have water distribution, about 38% is interest. The reason is the following. If you buy a car, uh, the steel company from which the car is made has borrowed money and gets paid back in, in the cost of steel. The car manufacturer buys the steel with the price of interest built in and has the same thing. So by the time you actually hold the whole process, the average on the economy is 35%. 35% of everything you buy, whether it's an apple or a car, is interest. And that's the mechanism that actually by which the transfer happens. You may actually not borrow a penny. You're still buying whatever you need to buy to live. That's what happens. The most extreme form is public housing where 77% is interest. 
So it gives you a flavor that the mechanism is automatic. It's actually a suction device that transfers automatically to the top. The fifth point, short-termism. That's the more difficult to understand usually, how that relates to money. But we all agree that it is a problem. Okay? Our entire economic system is driven to think short-term, and we complain about that and trying to convince people on an ethical basis to change, and it isn't working very well. There's a reason why it's not working very well. Because corporations work with money, conventional money. Corporations are actually my claim is that, up in, the, uh, in the contrary of what is said in every textbook, that corporations are uh, competing in the, in, for markets and resources. In fact, what they're doing is competing for money, using markets and resources. The purpose is money. So that's the driver. Now, how does that work? The consequence, of course, is the proverbial Ostrich, which doesn't look very far beyond its horizon, and its horizon is in front of his eyes. Let's take a very simplified worldview. Let's assume that I have investment capacities in two types of trees. One of them <coughs> is uh, pines, and I'm going to make the numbers all very easy. It's going to take 10 years to be able to harvest the pine and bring up, say, $100. Or I take 100 years, and I have oaks, and I have $1,000. All the numbers are picked, or all the numbers are adjusted for inflation. So this is not about inflation. This is about the value, intrinsic value, for the trees in question. The numbers are chosen so that, actually, they're indifferent, right? I can plant 10 times the uh, pines and arrive at $1,000 in 100 years. Now, now comes in money. Because let's assume a currency with 5% interest rate. What happens? You have your pine that is worth, looked at from today, $61. That's called the discount of cash flow, technically. What it means is if I take $61.39 and put them in a bank account at 5%, 10 years later, I have $100. Simple as that. Now, what happens to our oak? $1,000 is worth $7.60. Mm -hmm. Because I put $7.60, 5% for 100 years, and I arrive at $1,000. What does that mean? When you have a currency with a positive interest rate, the future doesn't matter. The further you are in the future, the less it matters. Mm -hmm. We are programmed to think short term. In such a civilization, you only plant pines, right? Now, can we imagine something else? Well, the answer is yes, although we're not familiar with it anymore for a while. It's called demurrage. Imagine a negative interest rate, a parking fee on money. I know that sounds very strange, but what happens then? Well, the same pine looked at today through a currency with a 5% parking fee per year is worth $167. And the oak is worth $168,000. In a civilization with such a currency, people think long term without having to worry about their grandchildren or anybody in a green movement trying to educate people to think about the future for ethical reasons. They do it automatically. Such civilizations have existed. For several thousand years, it was the case in Egypt. And it was for 150 to 200 years in Western Europe, from the year 1000 to about 1290. So we had a period where we had such currencies used, and people built stuff to last forever. Now, the positive news about this is that it's not a regression of the human mind that we currently think on short term. What will be left of our civilization in 100 years or 1,000 years? My guess is probably our nuclear garbage. There's nothing that will last more than 50 years or 100 years of what we built today. 
okay? The temples in Greece, and, sorry, the temples in Egypt and in uh, uh, the cathedrals in the Middle Ages are still standing. You can still visit them. And it's not accidental. Mm -hmm. Now, how would that work today? And I'm going to take that as one example of a, a type of currency that I'm recommending to look at. It's the Terra. Imagine a currency that is based on a basket of commodities. Things like oil, copper, wheat, whatever. The major commodities that the global economy needs and that we actually use every day in our economy. And the currency is defined as a basket of these things, a standardized basket. Now, it would not be a currency created out of nothing. It would be a cur currency that's issued as an inventory receipt. What happens with an inventory receipt? Well, if you have a basket of commodities, that would be four times, even with nine commodities, we have four times less volatility than we have today with the dollar. That's the first thing. Second thing is, this is a very robust currency. It will resist any shock. Because the commodities are backed by it, are backing it, are actually available, whatever happens to the global system. And we can use these things. And finally, it's inflation resistant. Inflation is defined as a value of a basket. So if you take the basket as the unit, you have no inflation. Now, the final point, however, is that it costs something to store these things for the banking. And that cost is a dumber fee, 3.5% a year. So you have a negative interest rate currency, which is fully robust and actually can work in the current system in parallel with whatever exists today. So that's where the kind of solutions out of the box from the current environment that is available. And if you use such a currency, you will actually automatically think long term. If you allocate it rationally, that's what it will be doing. We need to use it as a reference, and it makes sustainability possible on a global level. I think we will not live in a world without corporations the next morning. It will take a little while. So we better have a way of resolving the conflict that currently exists between long-term thinking that is done for our society and the short-term programming that we get from our currency. And that solution is available. Now, the last is the competition. And I'm going to use a little story to define that. The story of Mother Goose. Once upon a time, there was a little village somewhere in the outback in Australia. And these people didn't know about money. So they were having ants once a week. They had a market where everybody would bring their hams and their chickens and their eggs and stuff, and they would start bargaining with each other and exchanging everything. Then one day, a foreigner came by and sat in a corner of the market and he saw a farmer trying to gather 12 chickens to exchange for a big ham. And he didn't very succeed and he started laughing and the wife of the farmer said, hey, you foreigner there, you know to deal with chickens better than my husband? Okay, and he said, oh no, no, no. No, no, I will not deal better with, chick with, with the chickens, but there is another way. You see that tree there? I'm going to sit under there, and one of you brings a big cow skip, and I have the family, each family come and visit me and I'll explain the better way. So, so said, they did it, and the, the, the stranger brought in a little knife and cut very nice little rounds in this cow skin and put a little seal on each one. A very elegant little seal. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, look. One of those rounds equals a chicken. So now you can use the rounds instead of the chickens to exchange each other. That looked like a brilliant idea. And then he said, by the way, I'm coming back next year. I'm coming back under the same tree. And I want each family to bring back 11 rounds. 
that is just a token of appreciation for the technological improvement that I made possible among you. Right? So, what needs to happen in the next year? Well, someone needs to go bankrupt to provide the 11th round. Because in this economy, the same population, same production, same quantity of money, you actually need to have a competition between players, users of that currency, in order to get money that is not there. So we are all competing with each other, automatically, when you use conventional money. It's not accidental that in a family, when the money topic comes up, typically it's the source of a problem. So the family is a place where we normally don't have competition. Now, to summarize, the use of conventional money systematically generates these five problems, these six problems, financial instabilities, cyclical money creation, compulsory growth, concentration of wealth, short-termism, and competition among its users. So, we have known for 40 years that uh, these problems are important, all people being concerned about sustainability have been hoping for improvements in that domain. There have been very little to show for it in the last 40 years. Actually, it's got no worse in all these domains. So, the reason I claim is that we're addressing the symptoms. We don't go to the systemic level. We don't look at the systemic cause. And I think that is what needs to happen. Now, the one positive of the instability of the system is that it's at the verge of crashing again. So, this is the time to learn about other solutions mm -hmm. in this domain, and they are available. There are now thousands of cases around the world of systems that are, people have started at the bottom up, business to business systems, city systems that actually are addressing these problems of various natures outside of the box of the conventional system. To conclude, the monoculture needs to stop. It, we need to go to a monetary ecosystem. And an ecosystem has a minimum amount of variety that makes it possible to survive when things are happening. Where with the systems that are useful to address for every one of those issues that we listed are already in existence. They just have to be generalized and scaled up. And the timing is now for two reasons. First of all, there's a technological shift. We're leaving the industrial age. We're moving into the information age. And the information age provides new challenges and also new means to resolve our problems. And the second one is value shift. Let me give you an image of that. At the beginning of the industrial age, there were people who were claiming that everything would change except horses, of course, right? The first trains were pulled by horses. Uh, by the way, when you needed a bigger machine, <coughs> what did you do? Well, you put up more horses. You had a third horsepower, power, a third horsepower, 30 horsepower farming machine. Okay? That's the way we're doing things. I claim the same thing is true now. Lots of writings have been happening, lots of theories have been proposing that everything will change in the information age except money. Now, it happens to be that money is information. So I'm pretty sure something will happen beyond that, which is the electronification of the existing money. That has already happened. 95% of all existing money on the planet is electronic, of conventional money. But the same technology can be used for other types of tools. And these tools exist. The second point, value shift. If you put all societies in history in one box, that are patriarchal societies, what these, current, these uh, societies have in common is to have a monopoly of a single currency created with interest. Patriarchy was invented in 3200 BC at the same time as writing, at the same time as debt in writing 
and money. And it wasn't sumer. And they invented the same period with three things. We've been still there. We've been still believing that we think it was a single currency to do everything. Now, the opposite of patriarchal societies is not matriarchal societies, because matriarchal societies have never existed. A matriarchal society would be a society where the male is reduced to procreation, which is the story of the Amazons, which is a pure myth. There is no, there is no archaeological or historical or, or anthropological evidence for an, a, an Amazon society. Matrifogal societies are ones that always have been using a monetary ecosystem. Two types of money. The patriarchal currency to deal with people you don't know long distance, and the second type of currency with Dunaraj, with the parking field money, to actually use in your own community. That you don't accumulate money. In those societies, everybody had money. And it wasn't scarce, because nobody was accumulating that second type of currency. Now, how do we know in what kind of society you are? Well, the shortcut is the image of the divine. When you have an image of the divine, that is a man with a beard, that has created everything without a girlfriend, <laughs> uh, you're probably in a patriarchal society. <laughs> now, if the role is played of the nice role and the divine is played by a lady, like Isis in Egypt, or the Black Madonnas in the Central Middle Ages that we were talking about, then something else is happening. You create a monetary ecosystem. So, <coughs> for those who are interested in getting some readings on these things, that's available in a bunch of languages. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.